The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he had sat down, his disciples came to him. He began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward will be great in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. It has been said, no more beautiful, um, no words more beautiful have ever been spoken than the words of Jesus. No more beautiful teaching than these Beatitudes. It's interesting that no one claims that any person who came after Jesus taught or spoke God's truth greater than he. So I think it's a beautiful gospel to sing, to hear that truth, because these words are beautiful. And to sing them is also beautiful. I mentioned to the choir at the 9.30 Mass that as a singer, it's also easy to sing this gospel because every line is broken into two parts. So a two-tone chant, pretty easy to do. Not so much with other gospels. A friend of mine on Facebook recently shared a quote. It said, people often say, life is short, so enjoy it. And maybe we, as Christian believers in eternal life, should distinguish ourselves from that mentality. Maybe something like, eternity is forever. Prepare for it. How important it is for us in this life to keep our eyes fixed on heaven where Jesus promises there for sure we will rejoice and be glad. And yet how many times for the children here present are we so excited about the next thing? Well, let me tell you, children, there's a lot of people in this room younger than me, about my age and older than me, who understand that you can go through the whole of your life just trying to achieve the next goal, get through the next chapter, and then realize there's still more that I'm longing for. As we begin Catholic Schools Week this week, I want to encourage us, especially who are parents with your children at whatever age, to think about how we desire for them to be happy. Do we think... You know, I want them to have the best chance to get ahead in life. 
I want them to get into a good school so they can have a good job, make a decent living. I want them to be happy, maybe even have a better life than I have. But all of these thoughts have one thing in common. They are solely focused on success in this life. Maybe growing in the wisdom of the world and in power. And we heard very clearly from St. Paul in our second reading today from 1 Corinthians. That's not really how God has operated the people he has chosen to be his most effective instruments. In fact, he even delights to choose the foolish, to shame the wise, to choose the weak, so that those who have power in this life realize that there is a greater power at work in the weak and give glory to God. St. Marceline Champagnat says this, we aim at something better. We want to educate children, to instruct them in their duty, to teach them to practice it, to give them a Christian spirit and attitudes, to form them to religious habits and the virtue possessed by a good Christian and a good citizen. So how might we change the list of like what a parent wants for their child that we said before. What if we were to make our goal and our greatest desire, I want my child to know God and to live according to faith, hope, and love. I want them to live the truth and witness to it in love to their neighbor. I want them not to seek to get ahead of their neighbor, but to learn to serve their neighbor. I want them to succeed in whatever vocation God is calling them to, not my vocation, if that's not their call, not what I want for their life. And ultimately, I want them to be a saint. I want them to go to heaven and even be a greater saint than I, provided that I still become the saint that I am called to be. It is so counterintuitive to the wisdom of this world, but then again, so are the Beatitudes which we heard proclaimed today. On the surface, they don't seem to make a whole lot of sense. (laughs) Happy are you when you're persecuted. Happy are the sorrowful. I mean, the word blessed means happy. How is it that the happy are sorrowful? Jesus, didn't you just say that they're sorrowful? Pope Benedict says that we'll never understand the Beatitudes in merely theoretical terms. They have to be lived. And through faith experience lived out, only then can we understand what is at the heart of them. Let's just take one of those Beatitudes. Blessed are they who mourn for they will be comforted. I've heard it said that the price we pay for love is grief, is sorrow. Jesus calls those who mourn blessed because they have encountered great love. And the greater the love they have known in this life, the greater their grief when that love is taken away. But Jesus, who is love incarnate, promises you who have loved, you will be comforted. You will rejoice and be glad in communion with the Holy Trinity and with all his holy ones in the next life. Mother Teresa, a more contemporary example of wisdom, 
also turns the world's wisdom on its head. Especially for those of us born and raised here in the United States and others who have moved to this country where we have such a great value, even we idolize freedom as an ultimate virtue. Speaking to a group of parents, Mother Teresa said, do not teach your children to be free. She said, teach them to love. And in loving, they will become free. See, if we promote freedom as an ultimate value without virtue, we can still be captive by the chains of our own selfishness. But if we learn that life is about loving and serving and laying down our life and our ego, and we learn to live love, then we will be truly free. This past week, I was at a conference in Fort Lauderdale, and one of the speakers said, vision without action is a dream. Action without vision is a nightmare. Vision with action can change the world. That is the goal of the Christian formation of our youth in the home and in Catholic education to give knowledge together with virtue, instruction in love, truth with wisdom, seeking first and foremost what is of eternal value than what is passing value, getting through the test, getting through the grade, getting the degree, so I can get the job. Our faith, like a language, has to be learned more from witnesses than from books. And it cannot be confined to a few hours during the school week. We need to be immersed in it. So many times I have consoled parents who said, Father, I I did everything I thought I needed to do. I put my children in Catholic school. I did this. I did that. And I just don't understand why my grown children don't practice the faith. But one thing that is very important to learn here and now is that instruction in faith cannot be outsourced. For those of you who have parents and neighbors who are parents with young children. You know, I get it. There's a lot of things in life that we outsource, like soccer practice, swimming lessons. And parents take their children and they drop them off. They get instructed, they get formed, you pick them up. How is everything? Great. Because, I don't know about you, but I don't think I'd be ready to be a soccer coach or a swim teacher. Just don't have that skill, that knowledge. But parents, we can't do that in terms of instruction in the faith. I would say by analogy, rather than considering soccer practice and swimming lessons, consider this. What if your child were enrolled in a cooking class where they can grow in greater knowledge and understanding of food and how to prepare it and how to serve it? And at the end of the class, they get to eat the fruits of their labor. But imagine a child that only ate when they went to cooking class. How well off would that child be? Cooking class is a great thing, but we need to be nourished, body and soul and mind, every day by witnesses who are also with us on that journey. Parents, uh, again, uh, I want to encourage us to consider the Beatitudes today. The wisdom of the world is that a good parent will spare their child suffering, will set them up for success, make sure they have everything they have so they never have to shed a tear. 
But that is not the vocation to parenthood in the gospel. In our Beatitudes, Jesus tells us, Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. And when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you, even falsely, because they know that you know me. And because you're living like I lived. Rejoice and be glad because you have taught someone to integrate the faith so that they do not run when they encounter difficulty and suffering, but rather they carry their cross with me so that they too will share in my glory and in my consolation forever. So life is short. That part is true. But rather than living by a maxim, let's make the most of it. Let's enjoy it quickly. It's fleeting. I encourage us today to consider the wisdom of the Beatitudes. Eternity is forever. Let's use every moment we have received as a gift to prepare for it so that we may rejoice and be glad forever.